Hey there and welcome to Ball Parade Real Estate where I want to educate you all about real estate. My name's Matt and I'm a realtor from Regina. That's my trusted assistant Matilda and on this video we're going to teach you everything you need to know about buying a house in Canada. So if you are a first time home buyer sitting here thinking holy this is really overwhelming I don't know where to even start don't worry, we're gonna walk you through the process of getting pre-approved, looking at houses, writing offers, all the way up to possession day and everything in between. This is the exact same process I've been using with my own buyers for over a decade and I promise it's gonna work for you. In addition to this video, I have a first time home buyers course that you can check out. It's going into even more detail than this video along with checklists and PDF printouts that you can use to guide you through the process of buying a house. But before we get into teaching you everything you need to know about buying a house in Canada, we gotta start off with another terrible joke as we always do here on Ball Prairie Real Estate. And this one comes from Theo, I love viewer jokes. How many birds can you fit on a box of Fruit Loops? Toucan. If you have a terrible joke that I can use in a future episode of Ball Prairie Real Estate, put it in the comments below. Like this video and subscribe to Ball Prairie Real Estate if you love learning about real estate. Before we get into this buyer's guide, let's quickly talk about down payments. You need to have a 5% down payment minimum when you're buying a house in Canada but that's only if the purchase is under $500,000. If that purchase is going to be between $500,000 and a million dollars, you have to have 5% on that first $500,000, and then you have to have 10% on the portion from $500,000 to a million. If your purchase is going to be over a million dollars, then you have to have 20% down for the full amount. And this is again, only for primary residents. This is a house you are gonna occupy if you're an investor, it's basically always gonna be 20% down. But if you do not have 20% as a down payment, you must have what is called mortgage default insurance. Most people will call this CMHC fees. It's an additional fee that will be added to your mortgage. So you'll take off what your down payment is, then you'll add those CMHC fees on top, and that's what your mortgage will start at on day one. And don't take these fees lightly. They can add up very quickly. For a 5% down payment, the mortgage default insurance fee is 4% of the amount you are borrowing. So these are gonna add up to tens of thousands of dollars really quickly. I'll put a link in the description of this video to a website where you can see what those CMHC fees are based on what you're putting down. Then you're gonna need to have money set aside for your closing costs. Those are things like your inspections, legal fees, land transfer fees, etc. How much that's going to be is varies wildly by region, but easily it's gonna be a couple percent of your purchase. Now that you know all about CMHC fees and down payments, let's jump into my three phases of buying a house in Canada. This guide is broken up into three different phases with three to four steps in each one of these phases. We're starting off here in phase one, and this is the preparation phase. It can be a little boring, but don't skip ahead because if you don't do this preparation work, phase two and phase three become a lot harder and a lot more stressful. The first thing that you need to do when you're buying a house is get pre-approved because the last thing you want is to go out and start looking at houses. You're not pre-approved. You have no idea what your actual budget is. You may think you know what it is, but if you don't get that pre-approval, sometimes sellers won't even let you in their house. A lot of agents won't go out showing you houses and you have no idea what's gonna fit in your budget. But a common mistake that first time home buyers make is they just go to the bank and say, I wanna buy a house. The bank goes, okay, you make X amount of money so you can spend that amount. Go out and look at houses, you're good to go. No, that's not what you want. You want to sit down with your bank and I also suggest you sit down with a mortgage broker because they're probably gonna have better rates and better lending options to look at, but go and check out both of them. What you want as part of your pre-approval, that lender is going to pull your credit score. They're gonna verify your down payment, your income, all of that to make sure you've got all your docs in a row and everything's ready to go. Then they're gonna send you off in your way and say, here's what your budget is. And this is where another common first time home buyer mistake comes up and that is getting fixated on interest rates. Yes, interest rates are important, but they're definitely not the be all and end all of mortgages or lenders, not all lenders and mortgages are created equally. You wanna make sure that that person that is doing your mortgage is somebody you trust and rely on because you're going to need them in the future when you go to renew your mortgage or if you have to break that mortgage earlier. And you also wanna have the ability to pay out that mortgage early if you have to, say you're moving, or just you've had a bonus on work and you wanna throw it against your mortgage because being able to prepay it quicker, pay that mortgage down faster, is often gonna save you significantly more money than just a slightly cheaper interest rate. And go shopping around for your mortgage. First time home buyers often worry, well, if I go to three or four different places and they're gonna pull my credit score three or four different times, that's gonna hurt my credit score. 
The credit score algorithms now have improved and they understand that people are going to be rate shopping. So if you're going out to three or four different places and they're pulling your credit score, they will typically just count that as one hit on your credit, not multiple. So don't be afraid to go out and look at different options. Step number two is hiring your own real estate agent. As a first time home buyer, you're gonna be spending a lot of time with this person, so you wanna make sure that they have your best interests in mind, and they're gonna make sure that they get you into a fantastic house. But don't worry, I can help you out with that as well if you'd like. You're gonna see a link to my calendar in the description below. You can book me in for an appointment, I'll give you a call, talk to you about what's the most important thing in a house and a real estate agent, and pair you up with the best agent in your market. The next best person for a real estate agent recommendation, besides me of course, is your friends and family that have recently bought a house. Ask them who they use, what they liked or maybe didn't like about that person and create a short list from there. Your friends and family have your best interests in mind and they're gonna make sure that they give you a great recommendation because it's somebody that they felt they had a good experience with and that they trust. And then once you have a short list of real estate agents, sit down and interview them because you wanna make sure that they are gonna be the right person to help you through this process all the way from start to finish and they can walk you through any questions or problems you're gonna have in the home buying process. And you want somebody that can continue to help you build out the team of professionals around you to make home ownership a reality. Now, if you're not sure what to ask those real estate agents, don't worry, I've already got you covered there. Right here is gonna be a video that has a bunch of questions you can use to interview a real estate agent. I think you're gonna find that really helpful when you sit down with those agents to have some questions ready to go. Now that you've gone out and got pre-approved and picked your real estate agent, it's time to jump into step number three. Step number three is actually something you could start before meeting with a real estate agent and have this ready to go. And that is your wants and needs list. So you wanna sit down, I would say, get a piece of paper out and break it into three different columns. Have a column that is must haves. These are things you have to have in a house before you'd even consider buying it. Maybe it's location, size, style, bedrooms, schools, that type of thing. Then make a category that is deal breakers. If the house does have this or doesn't have this, it's an absolute deal breaker, you won't buy that house. And then put down the middle things that would be really nice to have. If it fits in our price point or in our neighborhood, these are things we want in a house if at all possible. You want this list for two reasons. One, of course, is that your real estate agent, they can't read minds, they need to know what you're looking for to be able to find you a great house. And you wanna bring that list with you when you're looking at houses to make sure that that wants and needs list you created, that this house actually has it. You wouldn't believe how easy it is for somebody to get distracted by that really awesome kitchen and not realize it has maybe a bedroom that's way too small and isn't gonna work for your family. So have that with you so you can kind of check it off. Yep, this house has all of these things that I wanted. And another little first time home buyer secret is that this list is likely going to change. Once you've gone out and looked at a few houses, you may decide that that garage that was a must have isn't as much of a must have anymore because you want a specific neighborhood or a specific price point and you're not gonna be able to get that garage. But also don't forget to tell your real estate agent that you've changed your priorities list because if they don't know that you've changed that list, they're not gonna be able to look for that house for you. That's the end of phase one. Now let's jump into phase two. We're gonna go out and actually look at houses and make an offer on one. Okay, so you've watched this far already. You're probably serious about buying a house in Canada and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know a great realtor. I want somebody to help me through this process. I have you covered. I have a great extensive network of real estate agents across Canada that I trust and believe are fantastic agents, some of the best in their market. So if you want to get set up with one of those fantastic agents, I'm going to put a link to my calendar in the description below where you can book me in. I'll give you a quick call. We'll chat about what you need in a realtor, but also what's important to you in a house. And I'm going to get you set up with one of those fantastic agents in your market. Now we're into phase two, which is the fun phase. We're gonna actually get out and look at houses in person. Your agent is gonna be sending you houses to look at, but don't stop looking on your own. Buying a house is a team effort. I'm gonna give you a mantra to live by when you're looking at houses. First off, you're not there to just kick tires and see if you like it. You are there to make the decision, is this where I want to live? Does this feel like home? It doesn't matter how good the house is, if it doesn't feel right, it's not the right house. But I promise you, you are gonna walk in a house and go, wow, this is absolutely awesome. This is the house for me, I wanna live here. Don't forget though, that in today's day and age, it's not uncommon for the sellers to have microphones or video cameras inside and outside the house. So you have to expect that any house you're going in to see, you are being recorded. 
If you wouldn't say it to the seller's face, don't say it in the house. Even if you really like the house and you want to jump up and down and say, this is the one, let's write them a full price offer. Get back in the car and talk about it with your agent, not even on the front driveway, because those doorbells, those have video cameras and microphones as well. But if you've got that feeling that, yep, this house that you're in right now, that's the right one and yet feels like home to you, now it's time to jump into step two of phase two, and that is writing an offer. And you don't really want to sit around and think about it too long because good houses in good and bad markets still sell quickly. And if you think it's a good house, there's a good chance that somebody else does as well. This is where the process of buying a house is gonna feel really real and things are gonna happen in very quick succession. So all of that prep work that you did in phase one that was really boring, well, that's where all that hard work needs to come into play, making this process a lot easier and it's gonna be probably a lot smoother as well. Now, every offer, just like every single house, is going to be different, just like there's different rules in each individual province. You're gonna lean on your agent to talk you through this whole process, but let's go over some of the basics so you know what to expect when you're going into this process. There are four major components of an offer and we'll go through them one by one here. The most obvious is gonna be price, what you are willing to offer the seller as a purchase price. If it's a really hot market, you might be offering above asking. If it's a buyer's market, so it's cooler, you probably have an opportunity to get a price below the asking price. Now, unless you're in an insane, crazy seller's market, you're going to be writing what's called a conditional offer. Basically, you are telling the sellers, I will buy your house as long as the following things are satisfactory to me as a buyer. These will be things like getting approved for your mortgage, doing inspections, and any other additional items you need to do as part of your due diligence to make sure that this house is what you think it is and it's still the right house for you, you're gonna put a timeline on those conditions as well, saying that I'm gonna have all of this work done in a set number of days. On every listing, there is going to be a date from the sellers that is an ideal possession date for them. They might have a specific date or say something like 30, 60, 90 days. This is an area that you can use as a negotiation tool or an advantage when writing an offer because if you can meet that seller's ideal possession day, well, there's one less thing to fight about. The last major component of an offer is what you want included with the purchase of that house. So if you want things like furniture or appliances, you have to ask for that as part of your offer. A general rule of thumb to work by though is that if it is attached to the property or attached to the land that the property is on, it is coming with that property as part of the purchase. You don't have to ask for it independently, but appliances, furniture, things like that, you'll have to ask for that as part of your offer. Step three is getting the house inspected. And these inspections are gonna be one of those conditions you put on the offer as part of the offer to purchase. And what inspections you need to do well, it's gonna very much depend on what type of property you're buying, so I can't give you a be-all, end-all list of what has to be done. Ask your agent what types of inspections need to be done as part of this purchase, because there may be specific things in your market that don't come as part of the home inspection that need to be done in addition. So for example, in my market, we do home inspections, but those often don't include sewer. You have to get that done separately. Common inspections that are done are home inspection, Mechanicals, that includes plumbing, the entire HVAC system, electrical, sewer, foundation, and sometimes even environmental like mold testing. And then lean on your agent and ask them if there's additional inspections, maybe foundation or fuel tanks that need to be looked at by a specific professional as part of the overall inspection process. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret here, and that is the day you do all your inspections, when you do the walkthrough with the inspector, it's gonna be kind of a negative day. You're gonna feel pretty bummed out thinking, the house I wanted to buy is a piece of crap. Trust me, it's not. But you've paid the home inspector to tell you all the bad things about the house. They're not there to tell you about all the good things in the house. So just understand, when you sit down with that inspector, everything they're telling you is gonna be bad news. Take a day to kind of digest that information. Go back and look at it again once you've had a kind of a day, that 24 hour rule, to let everything settle. There's also no such thing, in my mind at least, as an absolute red flag must walk away from because it's all about your level of tolerance. Say for example, you're an electrician. If there's an electrical problem, that might not be a very big deal for you because you know how to fix it. But if you're not an electrician, electrical problem might be a big deal for you. Again, it's all about 
what comes up in this inspection and can you tolerate it? Can you get these things fixed or repaired if you need to do so? And once you have got that inspection report, and again, there are gonna be things that come up there for sure, you need to make a decision. Are these not a big deal? Things you can kind of fix up on your own. A lot of this is gonna be little repairs here and there. Is this a major issue that needs to be addressed? And is this big enough that maybe this isn't the house for you anymore because you found a significant problem with it? Or is this something where we're gonna go back and negotiate with the sellers and say, we'd like a price reduction, we'd like this fixed before possession day. This is all gonna be very dependent on what type of situation you're in. So again, talk with your agent and say, okay, now that we've found these problems, what do we do next? Now we're into phase three, and I like to call this the moving phase because you have almost bought a house. We'll be talking about that in one second, but you need to know what you need to do from when you actually make that purchase all the way up to possession day. Step one here is removing conditions. When you wrote an offer, if you made it conditional to things like getting your financing approved and doing inspections, you then need to notify the sellers that your conditions have been satisfied. This is all gonna be done in writing before a set deadline that you would have put in your offer. Once you have done that, that means the house is officially yours. It also means though that that deposit that came with your offer is now in jeopardy if you back out of the deal. So if you change your mind after you have removed conditions, the seller gets to keep your deposit. If your conditions are not satisfied, you can collapse the deal and you will not have that deposit go to the seller. It'll be returned to you. But once you've done that, congratulations, you've now bought a house. But this isn't the end of the process of buying a house. We still got two more steps here in this phase. Step two, and this is boring, but it's important. You probably know that you need home insurance. You're actually gonna need proof of home insurance before you meet with the lawyers to sign off on all your final documents. And that'll typically happen a couple of weeks before possession. But there's also two other additional insurance policies that you should probably have in place. A lot of people think of life insurance, and that is important if you were to pass away. You don't want to leave a big expensive bill to whoever is named in your will. You also probably wanna have what's called disability and critical illness insurance. Usually they're paired together, and that is if you become disabled or ill and you are unable to go to work, well then what happens to that mortgage payment? You may not be able to pay it if you don't have a large savings account. Disability and critical illness insurance can step in and provide you an income. Now, this insurance is expensive, but I've had the unfortunate task of selling people's houses who are going to lose them to the bank because they got sick or they got hurt and weren't able to keep paying their mortgage. Step number three here is getting everything ready for possession day. So that's booking your moving trucks or getting your friends to come over to help move you, getting all your utilities set up and your mail forwarded from your old address to your new address. You wanna make sure you have all that in place before possession day so you're not scrambling on possession day to get all that done. Or as often happens, for example, with forwarding your mail, people forget about it and they miss some important mail. I actually, I kind of lied to you a few minutes ago when I said that there were two steps left. There's three here, and that is possession day. When you get possession of the house, the realtor is gonna give you the keys and you're gonna have to go through and you're probably really excited. You wanna start moving all your stuff in. Hold up for one second here. Do a walk both around the property and the outside and through the inside. Make sure that all the inclusions you had asked for in the offer, like all the appliances, are still there. Garage door remotes, that's often something that people forget about because they have them in their car. They pack everything up and move out and they have the gradual remote still in their car. So make sure all those inclusions are there and make sure that the property is in good condition. The expectation is that the property is going to be given to you in similar condition to when you viewed it. Now understand that people are moving out. There's gonna be some nicks and dings in the wall, but we're talking about major damage like holes punched in the wall or doors missing. Crazy things like that have happened before. So do a walkthrough in the house to make sure that everything is there and in good working order. I'd also recommend having a locksmith come by in those first couple of days, change out all the locks, give you brand new keys so that only you have a key to that house because you never know how many keys the previous owner gave out to friends and family and neighbors. So for your own security, get the locks changed. And then the most important step when buying a house, this is the last thing you're gonna do, but if you don't do it, you cannot buy a house in Canada. And that is, you gotta go out in front and take that photo, put it up on Instagram, because if it's not up on Instagram, did you actually buy a house? There you have it. That is my first time home buyer's guide till they got bored and left already. If you want that more in depth buyer's guide, I've got the link to that in the description below. If you just wanna watch more videos about buying a house in Canada, right here is my first time home buyer's playlist. 
or this video right here is what the YouTube algorithm says you need to watch next on Ball Prairie Real Estate. Thanks very much for watching.